I'm the I'm the uh, MC today. Okay. I'm going to share my screen with this. For, for those who are attending remotely, do they just have to go to the link provided on the SPU page where there will be a YouTube thing, or do they have to find the YouTube link that will be on the page? Um, the link that I emailed to you to forward off with the invitation will um, there. Rohit is going to make that link active. So once they click on that, they, they'll see the live stream will be there. I see. That's just the colloquium PHP page. Okay, great. Maybe you could encourage uh, friends and family who might be watching in, in, um, on the stream to text you or email you questions directly. Um, that might be one workaround for the question uh, part. Rohit, let me know when we're um, good to go. Does everybody see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Should it, see the presenter view. Jana, should I introduce them based off of these yes. files or should I use the PDF uh, document? It, it's the same order. It's the same so order, but is, does it all have all the text from the document on it or is no. it? No. It Just does the not. Titles. Um, actually, the dissertation is there. You'll see that on the slides. Yeah. You can use this. I can? Yeah. I, I okay. practiced saying all of the technical language in some of the other ones. Now I'm kind but of first, disappointed. Before we go much farther, Gianna, you're going to need to turn presentation mode off. We, uh, guys, we are live right now. Um, like we can see the video on the page. Um, we are done with that. So. And uh, like I have made Eric back the host, so that's that's it. Okay, where? I'll share the uh, uh, the page URL over here in the chat if anyone wants to like open it. Okay, does this look right? So I think we see your presenter settings, not the full screen slideshow. I don't know how to. Uh... Oh, there it is. This so Gianna, right there on that on that screen. Go over to the right. See, it says use presenter view. Uncheck that under monitors on the far right side of the menu you're currently on. There you go. Thank you. And okay. then now go back into slide view and that or slideshow and that should work. Thank you. Maybe a share screen thing. Maybe you're selecting only the app rather than your whole desktop. So we're seeing only the PowerPoint app. Okay. No, she oh. just needs to go back into slideshow mode. That's all. So just click Here. from the beginning or do it down in the on the bottom. Yeah, it's not allowing me to, Katie. It's not starting? No. Um, down at the bottom? 
Yeah, can you try the, the button down next to the Zoom slide in the lower right hand corner? Here? No. Nope. Bottom right hand corner, all the way. Yeah, close. There's a little slideshow figure that's right next to the Zoom slide. There you go. I'm clicking that and nothing's happening. Okay, I'll close PowerPoint and reopen it. Okay. And then Gianna, do you have two? Do you have two screens or one? I have two. Maybe that's why. That's why. Okay. Um, I could walk you through it, or you could email me the slides, and I could run it for you. Okay. Um, all right, what you're going to have to actually, it's a different slide. It's a different share mode. So unshare your slides, you have to go into advanced and you have to choose show partial screen. Then you have to put your, um, and then you need to resize the green box to just what you want them to see from your screen. So right now, Right now, the green box is both of your monitors. You need to change the green box so it is only the monitor that shows the slideshow. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna send this to you, Katie. Okay. Apologies to the yes. folks out there in the internet. Um, you're getting a peek behind the, the magic curtain. We'll start very soon. Okay. Yay. Everyone can see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So everyone just tell me when you want me to advance the slides. Great. All right, so should we get going? I think we should. Um, so, uh, I, I take it everyone is um, either checked in to Zoom or is watching through the stream. Uh, on behalf of the Graduate School, welcome everyone to the Dissertation Doctoral Colloquium in, for 2021. I'm Eric Wertheimer, Dean of the Graduate School at Stony Brook. Uh, I'm fond of saying that graduate students teach the faculty more than the other way around. Few faculty actually want to admit this. And I'm usually not talking about disciplinary expertise. I'm talking about cultural and social awareness and a better grasp on a future that looms larger and more imaginatively in younger eyes. But today, I mean it straight up, disciplinary knowledge. You guys teach us. President's award winners have taken the primary work of graduate study and turned it into excellence that has been recognized by the faculty, the graduate school, and the university. The President's Award to Distinguished Doctoral Dissertations has the following criteria it's worth listening to. 
First, the outstanding merit of the candidate's dissertation and its research base. Second, the candidate's exceptional contributions in ability or service to the university, which must be of such a nature as to warrant special citation. And three, how in completing doctoral study, the candidate overcame a personal or social handicap of an unusual nature, warranting special recognition. For example, this could include a difficult family situation or financial hardship, a learning disability, or similar adversity that the student overcame. These five brilliant young scholars, Megan Buckley from English, Shuja Chen from math, Sebastian Dick from physics, Sinduja Tirumalai Govindarajan from biomedical engineering, and Jonathan Roski from, from linguistics are here to tell us about their work. On behalf of the Graduate School and the Stony Brook community, thank you, each of you, for teaching us so well. So we're looking forward very much today to little mini conversations based on the work that is so outstanding. So we're gonna go through each uh, award winner uh, who will present, I think in a 10 minute blocks, uh, and we welcome questions um, by whatever means. And we were discussing this previously. Uh, for those of you who are not on the Zoom, uh, if you have a, a way to communicate directly with each scholar, um, please do so uh, for questions. Uh, otherwise, if you can access Zoom or any of us, uh, myself, uh, KDM, the assistant dean who's on this call, Lori Karen, um, any other, Gianna, uh, Gianna Giuliano Hooper, any of the graduate school representatives that are on this call, uh, do so. Uh, but try your best to, to make yourself known in whatever way you can, and we'll try to accommodate your questions. So um, without further ado, uh, the first speaker today is Megan Buckley. Are we moving the slide? Great. Um, Megan uh, is a PhD candidate in the Department of English. Her dissertation is called Warscapes, Mapping the American War in Iraq Through Literature. Her dissertation research emphasizes that ecology and physical setting play an integral role in contemporary American and Iraqi memoirs, blogs, and fiction about the Iraq War and produces a new pseudo-physical terrain that she terms the warscape. This sounds like an incredibly transdisciplinary and important work. Uh, so Megan, please tell us more about your work. Sure, I'd be happy to, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, I think I can share my screen, right, Gianna? Because I have a small PowerPoint. Yes. That I want to share, okay. Perfect. Let's hope this works for me. Can everybody see that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, before I get started, I just wanted to begin by thanking the Graduate School for hosting this event for us. Um, and I wanted to congratulate my fellow award winners. I'm happy that you are all here and I'm excited to hear about your work too. Um, so I, I timed this talk, it should be about six and a half minutes. Um, and I'm basically just gonna go through an overview of the project and kind of what it's about, and then some conclusions of the study. Um, and that's what I'll, I'll talk about. So uh, my dissertation argues that environmental setting and the natural world play a key role in contemporary short stories, poetry, memoirs, blogs, and personal essays about the Iraq war. I contend that this attention to nature and place is useful because it allows readers to comprehend the global war on terror as a physical conflict, challenging its characterization as a smart war that used drones, cyber attacks, and chemical weapons without real or lasting environmental impact. My dissertation's focus on the landscape of combat zones requires an acknowledgement of the growing link 
between landscape and trauma theory. Many recent studies within trauma theory have started the important work of moving beyond definitions of trauma that only account for individual perspective and interrogate the connection between individual memory and the environment. Steadily over the past two decades, critics have challenged trauma theory's lack of inclusivity for types of trauma outside the singular catastrophic event and the ability to recover from trauma without testimony and witnessing. Within literary studies, scholars have found problems with the tropes of fragmented and circular narration, inarticulation, inaccessibility of memory, and repetition that have come to signify trauma in literary form. The primary text that I have chosen for my dissertation admittedly contained some of those characteristics, but utilize alternative genres instead of the novel, including memoir, short stories, blog entries, and poems. At its core, my dissertation reframes landscape from a backdrop where the action of war takes place to a central metaphor for examining the way that war changes the spaces in which it is fought in the short and long term, or put another way, produces a new pseudo-physical terrain called the warscape. So on this slide, I kind of chart the trajectory of this term because this is not my term. This was originally an anthropological term that has now since become a political geographical term. And my contribution or, or my project's contribution is using it in a literary or rhetorical way. So that's what, what my study is doing. So the idea of the warscape was first coined by anthropologist Carolyn Nordstrom, who described it as the interaction and communication between different players in combat zones from civilians native to those spaces, to those who emerge because of the conflict, including soldiers, arms dealers, medics, and the media. From the perspectives of political geographers, the warscape has been analyzed more recently to include the impact of environment and nature to think about how the boundaries between ecology and culture are tested, altered, or dissolved in times of war. My dissertation combines these two definitions and views the warscape as both a theoretical framework and as a place-based model for thinking about the terrain that encompasses a war zone, a combat zone, and a safe zone within contemporary war literature. The warscapes of my chapters span many different versions of Iraq, from poetic renderings of Iraq in the 11th century to short fictions that connect the most recent wars in Iraq to its conflicts with Iran in the 1980s, all the way up to 2000s Iraq in the early years of American occupation. However, I also use contemporary American veteran memoirs to emphasize that the warscape cannot be contained to Iraq alone. It follows veterans back to the United States as they adapt to new ideas of home, family, and civic duty. Analyzing the way that physical space, setting, ecology, and environment operate in contemporary Iraq war literature reveals that the warscape is not neatly confined to where the war physically happens, but is a fluid and transient concept that endures across time and space via wartime writing. The following key takeaways identify nature and setting as instrumental factors within contemporary military and civilian wartime literature. First, nature and setting play an important role in contemporary wartime and post-war literature across genres. My project's chapters on contemporary war poetry, short fiction, blog posts, and memoirs emphasize the varied ways that nature and environment metaphorize the stories of war. Second, writing about nature and place provides common ground to bring together otherwise oppositional figures of the warscape, most notably soldiers and civilians across time and space. The interactions between civilians, the military, and the media are crucial to unpack the new social dynamics that wars produce. And this dissertation underscores that such interactions take place via wartime writing as much as they do face to face. Third, these texts demonstrate that place and environment can act as powerful mediators of trauma, despite the techno supremacy and physical and moral distance that define modern warfare. As drones, smart bombs, and cyber attacks move contemporary warfare further away from the conventional battlefields, trenches, and no man's lands of traditional warfare, modern warfare's physical components and effects linger. 
While traditional definitions of landscape conjure images of specific locations and environmental features, the warscape achieves the opposite in its ability to describe the way war operates in numerous places simultaneously, in combat zones, in civilian homes, on computer screens, and even within the veteran's own mind. The warscape is boundless, even as it attempts to use physical environment and setting as its primary architecture. In sum, my dissertation uncovers the way landscape and setting function in literature of the most recent war in Iraq in a variety of ways. Importantly, my dissertation's premise acknowledges that this idea of landscape manifests in multitudes, naturally and ecologically predominantly, but also in terms of narrative setting in place. In moving the focus away from individual trauma suffered by Iraq war service members and civilians, my study situates landscape and setting as alternative paradigms for theorizing trauma and the geological effects of war in literary form, revealing the multi-layered voices and subject positions that narrate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, amazing uh, work. Uh, I was just getting lost in reading through uh, a novel by Ahmed Zawi um, called Frankenstein in Baghdad. I don't know if you read that. Um, brought to mind a lot of this. Uh, anyway, um, I don't have any particular questions beyond wow. Um, and that I also myself write about war um, in American literary um, history. So I, I'd be interested to talk to you more about some of this stuff. Um, and particularly the idea of a warscape. Um, but I'm dominating here other questions, either from fellow award winners or faculty or folks out in the um, internet. Questions from Megan. I have a question for Megan. Um, so Megan, can you tell us a little bit about where you think that this work is going to go next? Sure. So, um, you know, because of the pandemic, I actually cut a chapter out of my study um, so I could finish on time. And um, I'd love to add another chapter to this study on um, a novel called War Porn by Roy Scranton. So um, that book is kind of about petrocapitalism as it relates to the Iraq war. So it fits into the environmental focus. And the chapters of my study are all um, based on a different perspective for each chapter. So there's um, an American military perspective in my first chapter in Iraq. There's an Iraqi civilian perspective in my second chapter and a veteran perspective in my third chapter. My last chapter is a pedagogy chapter. Um, but the chapter that I'd like to add on petrocapitalism is a three-part novel with all of those perspectives. So it would really link nicely to kind of insert into the project. Um, and Roy Scranton is actually an eco-critic, an Iraq war veteran um, and an English professor. So it would be kind of a, a nice addition to the study. And I'd love to kind of pursue a book project for this work. Megan, I was gonna just also, I, I'm thinking of intertext. I don't really have a great question um, for you, but uh, in the book I edited from NYU a few years ago called Critical Trauma Studies, there was a great piece called by Jackie Orr, who is an artist. Uh, she teaches at Syracuse. Um, called Lullaby for Fallujah, uh, which I think might be really interesting for you to ch just check out uh, if you can. If you can. Uh, it's a multimedia piece. Uh, oh, great. It really kind of cool. OK, I'm not familiar with it, so yeah. I'll do that. Absolutely. Other questions or comments? OK, seeing none, we'll move on. So our next speaker is Shuja Chen from mathematics. This is very difficult for me to, to, to work through uh, in, 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 in the sheer uh, syllables pulling together. So bear with me. Uh, her dissertation is called Steenrod Pseudocycles. Oh, is it Sebastian next? No, Shuja, OK. okay. Her dissertation is called Steenrod Pseudocycles, Lifted Cobordisms and WDVV Relations of String Theory. 
She is a PhD candidate in the Department of Mathematics, working at the interface of symplectic topology. I like that word, symplectic. Enumerative algebraic geometry and string theory. Her dissertation establishes the long conjecture WDVV type equations, recursion formulae for real Gromov Witten invariants in a ver variety of settings. Please tell us what this is all about, Shuja. Um, okay, let me start sharing the screen now. All right. Uh, thank you, organizers, for this opportunity to speak. And congratulations, everyone. I'm sorry for that long list of terminologies in that introduction. So I'm keeping my title simple here. It's just about counting real curves. Uh, let me start with some uh, background. So string theory is a theoretical physics framework that aims at unifying all of the fundamental forces of nature. There, elementary particles are represented by vibrating strings. So a loop, for example, is a closed string. It's just a circle, nothing else. Uh, and the open string is just a line segment. But they are really, really tiny. So you can't really see them, but the uh, theoretically, they are like this. As time goes by, they trace out surfaces in the space time. For example, as time goes by, a closed string emerges and it just keeps moving in the space and eventually it vanishes. Similarly, su such an open string, it emerges. As time goes by, it traces out something and it vanishes later on. Information about the structure of the space-time which we live in is encoded in the counts of such surfaces. Mathematically, we study the so-called pseudo-homomorphic curves, which are just such surfaces here. They are um, classical solutions to stream path. We study the pseudo-homomorphic curves lying in the so-called syntactic manifolds. It's a, uh, this is actually a made up word by mathematicians. But what, what they really uh, represents are, you can think of them as, as parts of the space time that we live in. So that's objects we want to study because we're interested in what kind of space we really live in, right? My research lies in the field called symplectic topology, which is the study of symplectic manifolds. In the old days, is the mathematics of classical mechanics. But in modern times, a large part of, of this field concerns uh, pseudo-homomorphic curves. Let me remind you, it's uh, pseudo-homomorphic curves are just those surfaces traced out by, by strings. Gromov with invariants introduced by Gromov and Witten in the 1980s is, is the count of closed pseudo-homomorphic curves. So remember, such a sphere is the surface that's traced out by a closed string in the space-time. Gromov-Witten invariants count such pseudo-homomorphic curves of fixed energy passing through given points, lines, etc. So here's a picture to illustrate it. My ambient space X is a symplectic manifold which we are interested in studying. And I have some points, H2, lines, H1, surfaces, H3, et cetera, in X. And we are interested in counting the number of surfaces looking like the sphere here, this, this red guy here that passes through them. That's also of a, of a fixed energy. The, simplex, the simplest example is just passing through two points on the plane, there's a unique line. So this number, this number one is 
an example of this gormon weight invariant. So although the definition may look complicated, in, sim in simple cases, they are the familiar objects that we encounter in elementary geometry. So the natural question is, how do we compute this, this counts? There's a powerful tool called WDVV equations, which originates in physics. What it does is that it relates the sphere counting group of weight invariance of different energy. And for many simplex manifolds, it determines all of these counts recursively. So therefore, it is a very effective way of computing this, this counts. Mathematically, it's established in the early 1990s. All right, now we have a good story about the counts of spheres which are traced out by loops. What about those so-called open pseudo-homomorphic curves which are string paths traced out by open strings? Remember an open string is a line segment. So it traces out a surface with boundary looking like this disk here. The so-called open gram of weight invariance is the count of such, for example, disks in my simplex manifold whose boundary is required to lie on a submanifold, a subset of the, the manifold. So here's an illustration. I have my ambient space. I have a fixed subset in it. I have some points and lines in it. And I want to count the number of pseudo homomorphic disks looking like this, this red guy here, whose boundary lies on this brown subset, which also passes through H1 and H2. However, different from the uh, sphere case before, this count is well defined only under certain assumptions. It's not always well defined. It was a celebrated theorem by a mathematician called Washinger that um, in the case when the simplex manifold satisfies a condition called real. So real is an assumption to make an assumption on a simplex manifold, which also naturally appears in physics. So Washinger showed, uh, he defined counts of pseudo-homorphic disks for real simplex manifolds of dimensions four and six. And of course, we can ask the same question again. How can we compute these numbers? Do I have some powerful tools just like the WDVV relations in the uh, closed case? Indeed, in, in two, 2007, mathematician Solomon proposed WDVV type equations for, for this counts of pseudo-homorphic sort of disks in the dimension four case. And for many real simplex manifolds, this equation is determining all of those invariants as well. So you can see, indeed, we, we can expect to have such a thing, which gives, gives us a um, effective way to compute this invariants. It was proved, so those um, WDVB type equations was, was proposed but not proved uh, in uh, back, back then in his work. And the proof was given by me after 11 years. That's the content of my thesis. I proved these equations. And in a later work joined with my thesis advisor, we proved that similar equations hold in dimension six case as well, if we propose some assumptions. Uh, yeah, so that's the that's the content of my thesis work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shuda. Questions? I don't have a question per se, but the first curve, as soon as you saw the curve, I was reminded of the movie Arrival, 
we just watched it over the weekend where the language is represented as a space time in a circular format. Um, so you are looking at space time in a similar fashion, right? I mean, it's not as a language, but as a, a something that varies, co varies, and you're trying to model it. Would that be right? Uh, I haven't watched the movie yet. <laughs> I heard I heard it's about the about the, the language that like we um, we residents of the Earth how communicate with with aliens right <laughs> yeah that's that's an interesting question uh, my thesis is uh, I'm not entirely sure how to compare it with the the, the movie um, here I don't really think that we view the space time as something that flows the thing is we live in a space. As time, ch time changes by, like the space itself flows. So we live in a three dimensional space. But as time flows, it's like we add another dimension to the space. So the space time is something four dimensional. Right. So that's probably where you uh, kind of get this idea from. If I have like a, a string of space, as time goes by, it, it, it moves. And in that four dimensional space, you, you, get, you get a surface. But the, the space time itself is uh, something that I, I don't really, I don't really change it much. Shudra, is the sixth, what is the sixth dimension case? Uh, that you ended on. Right, uh, so, sorry, maybe I should uh, share screen again. Uh, yes, so in this uh, definition given by Washington, he showed that th this counts of disks are well defined in dimensions both of four and, and six. Oh, so those, those are dimensions that are specific to symplectic manifolds. Right, yes, these dimensions uh, are dimensions of the, the manifolds, yes. Okay. Right. I, I would say I understand, but I really don't understand. So, but um, I was, <laughs> this is, uh, this is wonderful though. Thank you. Um, I, and I also have to say your uh, drawings are very, um, they're, they're kind of beautiful in their simplicity. I like, I like looking at those drawings. Oh, thank you. Yeah, in, in math we often, you know, just draw pictures on, on the blackboard and um, as a way that helps us to think. Yeah, it's terrific. Hats off to Sinduja for asking a really good question that was actually on topic. I, I, I don't know how I would have otherwise come up with a question like that. It was great. Anyone else? Shuja, are you are getting any questions directly to you from? Uh, uh, no. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. That was amazing work. Thank you. So our next speaker, award winner, is Sebastian Dick from Physics. Um, his Dissertation is called, you know, just took over my script, hold on. Uh, his dissertation is called Improving Density Functional Theory with Machine Learning. He is a PhD candidate in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. His dissertation research examines how machine learning can be used to improve density functional theory calculations, leading to a faster and more accurate in silico design of new molecules and materials. Sebastian. Hi, everyone. So uh, thank you for hosting us and congratulations to all the other, um, all my fellow awardees. Um, very exciting work so far, uh, what we've seen. So. Um, I'm trying to share my screen. OK, 
Okay, can you see my presentation? Okay, great. So, oops, skipping ahead. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So, I want to discuss or I want to uh, give a quick overview of uh, my my PhD research, which dealt with how we can combine quantum mechanical calculations with machine learning. And um, yeah, I'll dive right into it. The laws of quantum mechanics tell us um, how matter behaves at an atomic level. So as chemists and physicists, we're particularly interested in the negatively charged electrons shown in red here as they determine how atoms bind to each other to form molecules and crystals. For example, in a, <clears throat> in a covalent bond, two atoms will bind by sharing electrons with each other. So understanding the behavior of electrons in detail allows us to answer questions like, why do certain chemical reactions happen and others don't? How do drug-like molecules interact with proteins and therefore change the way our bodies work? And how can I design better materials, for example, for more efficient batteries, energy storage, and other questions? So I should mention that these models that I'm showing you here um, are not very accurate. They're just a way that we can think about atoms, but they've been proven to be wrong. We go back to, to Niels Bohr. Um, it doesn't really matter too much. I'm just stating this so that people don't come after me, basically. But in a way, we can imagine atoms as electrons circling a, a nucleus in, a, in an orbit. So while the equations of quantum mechanics have been studied in great detail and are, are well understood, uh, we know that solving them exactly is really only possible for the smallest systems. The hydrogen atom, for example, consists of only one proton and an electron, and that one can be exactly solved in order to think about it. However, once I go to more complex molecules, I have to consider interactions between electrons and electrons explicitly. And this is where things get complicated. So imagine we have a number of electrons, n electrons, given by these dots here. Naively, one might think that the problem scales quadratically in n, because n squared is really proportional to the number of ways that I can pair up these electrons to interact with each other. However, due to the quantum nature of the system, I need to treat these electrons as indistinguishable particles. And they, the solution to the, the equations has to fulfill certain other properties as well. This complicates matters. And it turns out that the true scaling of the solution of this uh, problem scales as some constant to the, uh, to the power of the system size. So one can easily see how this number blows up very quickly <clears throat> for, uh, for large N. So much that you know, having maybe 100 electrons is basically not um, tackable by, by conventional hardware, even if I use supercomputers that are already out there nowadays. So to still be able to tackle systems with, with hundreds of electrons, chemists and physicists have developed different approximations. One of these approximations that I'm particularly interested in is called density functional theory or DFT for short. The basic premise of DFT is relatively simple. <clears throat> so rather than keeping track of all the electron-electron interactions, as we saw earlier, we're now merely interested in how a single electron shown here interacts with an averaged out electron density that is shown as this gray shaded region and is denoted by N. There's only one problem, <laughs> only one problem, the uh, interaction of how this electron interacts with the density, uh, which we usually write in terms of this potential V is not exactly known. So we have to find clever approximations for it. I will get back to this issue in a moment but let's assume for now that we have a decent approximation for this term B, okay? So what we really want to do, going on here? what we really want to do is um, if we have a molecule, say very simple dihydrogen, H2, we want to calculate the electron density of this molecule because that will tell us where are the electrons and what are they, what are, what are they doing basically. And we, we know how to do this in principle. 
we can write down the equations that govern the system. And by solving these equations, we can then solve for the electron density. Um, you don't have to worry about the equation itself too much if, you, if you're not familiar with the concept. If you are, however, already in this field, you will notice that this is just a one particle uh, Schrodinger equation and an effective potential given by this V here. And it's really this V that, that needs to be found. So over here in this little animation, you can see how um, so solving this equation happens in practice. So we start from an initial guess where I localize everything on, on one side. And then by iteratively solving this equation, we can relax the electron density to its solution, to its ground state. And, um, and therefore, you know, get information about where the electrons are in this molecule. This is all nice, but remember, we still have to find a good approximation um, for this V. And this is where the problems start. There are approximations out there, but not, we would like to do better than the existing approximations. And so my contribution um, uh, was to, to use neural network, use a specific form of a neural network to write and parameterize this potential V. So doing this, we can use optimization techniques from machine learning to tweak the internal parameters of this neural network. You can think of the internal parameters as like dials that you can, that you can control to change the behavior of the neural network. And what the neural network really does is it gives, it behaves like a really complex function. You put a number in on one side or multiple numbers in on one side and you get one or multiple numbers out on the other side and they will differ in some mapping. So, we can do this to get more, uh, to get better and more accurate um, approximations for this potential, thereby also better results. For example, from experiments, we might know that, in fact, for this dihydrogen molecule here, the electron density localizes more around the cores, around the nuclei. Now, using our tools, our approach, we can ask and answer the question, which parameters inside these neural networks, do we have to tweak to actually see this behavior in our calculations? Now, if we take this further, if we have enough reference data, not only on dihydrogen, but other molecules as well and other crystals, we can systematically use our approach to improve density functional theory. And by that, make routine calculations that are often done in chemistry and physics more accurate. We're, we're hopeful that this will accelerate advances in drug development and material science where DFT is a very uh, common tool by giving researchers um, yeah, these improved tools to make high fidelity predictions. And with that, uh, I'm gonna thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, wonderful talk. I, th I think I was able to follow most of it. Um, and again, your the tools that you use to, to communicate are really wonderful. So, um, so questions, comments. We actually have another workaround. Uh, folks are offering questions in the YouTube stream. Um, so Rohit will send those questions on to me and I'll, I'll ask them uh, as we get them. Could I ask a question? Absolutely. <laughs> great, great talk, Sebastian. Thank I like you. the animations for sure. Um, I don't pretend to understand all of it, but or any of it. Uh, I was just wondering, you talked a lot about theory and simulations and modeling. I was just wondering, is this possible to verify with experiments with science in its current state? And how useful would that be? Yes, it is, in, in fact. Um, Confirm, you can confirm it by experiments. Oftentimes it's through indirect observation. So for example, one thing we can do is we can put a lot of water molecules, fictional water molecules in a box and simulate how they move because we have the knowledge about all the energies and forces that govern how these water molecules interact. And then we can calculate certain observables from the simulation. For example, we can calculate the probability of finding two water molecules at a given distance 
averaged over, over the entire simulation. And that is something we can also measure with experiments. Usually the way it's done is you, you also have like real water now, right? You have water in a box and you shoot either x-rays or, or neutrons at the water box and you see how they're diffracted and that gives you information about this, the same probability distribution. And then we can compare the experiments to what our methods predict and, and therefore, thereby you know, saying, how well does our method do, right? And eventually the goal is not only to reproduce experimental results, that's usually a nice benchmark, sanity check, um, but then we wanna go further and, and predict things that experimentalists have not seen to guide further experiments, you know, propose molecules that then uh, chemists in a lab can synthesize and, and look at the properties in, in real life. So it's really a kind of a symbiosis between uh, experiment and theory. Thank you. So Sebastian, along those lines, and I think you sort of have hinted about this a little bit, what, what are some of the real world applications for this kind of uh, breakthrough? So the, the breakthrough is making DFT that which is a tool that was already out there more accurate, right? So for example, when you want to design new drugs, there are companies and, and research facilities out there that will you know, propose some drug-like molecule. And then they have to calculate how this molecule interacts with proteins in your body, which will determine how the, the drug works effectively. And now, these calculations are fairly uh, expensive to do. And it turns out that we want to do these calculations as accurate as possible, right? So, so that we don't miss subtle effects that might change how the drug interacts with our body. And so making, you know, making improvements to, to DFT will really push the, the field further in what they can achieve and what, what they can, can look at in terms of, of drugs, for example. Thank you. Uh, can I ask another question? Mm -hmm. So you're using machine learning to, um, to uh, like basically solve a special kind of equations that appears in physics? That right, yes. Like so solving the equation itself is actually not the problem. It's finding the equation that we want to solve. So oh. the, the equation itself is really a relatively simple um, differential uh, equation that we can, uh, that we know how to solve. But the terms inside the equation, those are the ones we need to find. And that's where the, the, the tricky, tricky stuff happens. Oh, I see. All right, thank you. Other questions, anything else from YouTube chat? Um, I have a delayed question, actually, that came from the YouTube chat for Shuja. Um, and it's from Annette Waisaki, who is the Dean of Nursing. Um, she asked, albeit it's outside of her expertise, she said, uh, would these equations change depending on the effects of gravity? Right. Uh, so the short answer to the question is, sorry, I don't really know. <laughs> so um, we, as mathematicians, the way we work is that we get models from physics. Like there are physicists that translate the language they use into like formal mathematical languages that we ask questions to. And I'm not really familiar with how the effect of gravity is like uh, expressed in mathematical language. So um, sorry, I'm not really sure about this. Good. Well, thank you for, for, uh, for that. I appreciate that. And I'm sure Annette does as well. Um, all right, so we'll move on then. Oops, I muted myself. We'll move on. Uh, our next speaker, our award winner, is Sinduja Tirumalai Govindarajan. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Sinduja. 
That's very close. Thank you. I'm okay, impressed. Good. All right. Um, this is such a humbling experience all around. Uh, uh, she is uh, a biomedical engineering PhD recently from December 2020. Her dissertation is called Magnetic Resonance Imaging of Multiple Sclerosis Pathology Computer-Aided Detection and Monitoring. I guess she's in the right school for, for this since I think MRIs were invented at Stony Brook. Uh, her dissertation research examined the structural changes in the brain associated with diminished cognitive performance in unimpaired young people with multiple sclerosis with the help of in vivo magnetic resonance imaging, advanced statistical and artificial intelligence methods. Sinduja. Thank you so much, Dean, for the kind introduction and the pronunciation as well. I, we should have talked about it before, but that was great. Um, I wanna thank the graduate school for giving me this opportunity and for uh, Gianna and others to organize this event so well. Um, congratulations to my fellow awardees. It's, it's an esteemed privilege to be talking here beside you. I am trying to move my screen around so I don't see Zoom, but I guess I will have to. Okay. All right, today I'm going to present a very condensed version of my dissertation on magnetic resonance imaging in multiple sclerosis. First, we define MS. So MS is a disease of the central nervous system where abnormal immune function affects the flow of information within the brain and between the brain and the rest of the body. I think we can all agree that the brain and the spinal cord are complex systems that together orchestrate all our cognitive functions, conscious and subconscious activities. The way this happens is through these highly interconnected pathways that transmit electrical and chemical signals between different parts of the brain and from the brain to the rest of the body. So these individual connections are made up of neurons or single nerve cells, where there's a cell body which acts like a switch, which makes the decision and transmits electrical signals down this cable called axon, all the way down to either more decision-making switches or maybe a functional outcome, which, which I'm representing as a light bulb. So if we are we're brave enough to make an oversimplification of the nervous system, we can think of it as a complex, dense electrical system where the different switches and knobs are working together to turn on the different light bulbs. And continuing with the analogy, just like cables have very thick plastic insulation around them to protect the signal transmission, so do neurons. So these axons, which are the cables in our case, are covered with an insulating layer of a fatty substance called myelin. And it is this myelin that is attacked by immune cell cells in multiple sclerosis. So this is not a normal function, it's the abnormal function, as I said. This is what makes MS an immune-mediated disease. Now, as you can imagine, with loss of this myelin over time, um, there, there is a disruption in the flow of neuronal communication from the brain to the rest of the body. This manifests in symptoms such as movement difficulties, fatigue or weakness, and also impacts cognition, learning, memory, among other functions. These challenges can be hard for any patient of any age, but it's particularly challenging in pediatric and young adult MS patients. Childhood and adolescence is a period of time where uh, children go through social and emotional development that are turning their education, and as they become adults, they're looking into early career stages. But this is also the period of time where the myelin is actively developing. Our brains are not fully developed in, until the 20s. The layer of myelin, which needs to protect the neuronal communication, is still building up. And this makes it imperative to have methods to detect changes in the brain earlier, even before the onset of of severe symptoms. And that's where my dissertation comes in. I use sensitive neuroimaging markers to study early brain changes in participants without any impairment to see if any of the brain changes are associated with subtle cognitive changes. And I do my dissertation with three specific aims. Um, so the first aim is 
looking at the cable pathways that are happening in the white matter of the brain to see diff damage in there. And for the second aim, I looked at the gray matter, which acts as the switch, the outermost layers of the brain. And for the third aim, I looked at these focal areas of tissue damage, and these you can call them scar tissue or lesions. So I investigate all three of them in my dissertation. So the first aim, using an MRI method for detecting diffusion along the cables or along these axons, I found that in young MS patients, these are all patients younger than 22 with a pediatric onset of disease, um, without impairment, there were still large areas of the brain where the cable pathways, the white matter was damaged. However, not all of this damage correlated with functional outcomes. As you can see on this slide, the only the regions in blue here within the brain had a correlation with tests of processing speed. So if the patients had damage in these particular areas, they also scored slower on the processing speed measures. For my second aim, I looked at loss of tissue that happens in severe MS. As you can see here, the brain shrinks over time with enlarged fluid spaces. And as I said earlier, the gray matter um, acts like the switch. These are the regions which control and originate signals which go into um, the white matter to the other parts of the brain. And here are charts comparing the average size of the cortex in healthy participants and MS participants. And we did not find any widespread loss of tissue, which is to, which kind of confirms that these are patients without any impairment. They don't have severe um, symptoms yet. However, when looking at interpersonal changes, so between different subjects, different, different patients within the MS sample, these areas of the brain, the highlighted in blue, these areas of the brain had lower sizes, which corresponded with slower attentional processing. So this was a test of executive function and they scored poorly, even though it was not poor enough to be diagnosed as, unimpair, uh, as impairment, there was the variation still had a very strong effect, statistically significant effect. And for AIM-3, I looked at focal uh, damage. So these, um, I'm just pointing them by these ovals, but these are areas of scar tissue that are formed in gray or white matter. And you, they are very visible on uh, MRI images. Typically in the clinic, these are the images which are acquired to look at follow-up scans to see if there are new lesions or if the lesions have increased or reduced in size. And it's very useful to be able to automatically outline them so we can automatically quantify them. So I used an AI method, just like Sebastian just showed, I used a neural network to automatically outline these lesions. And my method performed just as well as a manual reviewer. And it even caught some subtler changes that were missed. So I, that brings to the end of my talk. And I could not have accomplished any of this without the support of all the people on this slide and many others whose pictures I didn't take along with me. That's it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, who's that? <laughs> that's, that's my toddler helping. Well, he was an infant then, but he was helping me <laughs> work on my brains. Absolutely. Great. That's fantastic. Um, Stony Brook class of 20, 20, 2040. <laughs> sure, <Anyway>. yes. <laughs> He'll um, claim his desk. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Sinduja. Um, questions for Sinduja? Yes, Sinduja, I have a question. Um, yes. So, so can you tell me a little bit about what your thesis, what the implications of your thesis are are for for therapy? So, is the primary? Am I understanding it right that the primary advantage here is early detection, which means then we might be able to start some kind of treatment? Or did you also find some kind of insights that might tell us something you know special or new we might be able to do for these younger patients? Okay, so I thought something that I probably should have mentioned is that MS does not have a cure. It, the only solution right now is to treat, uh, detect it early and provide interventions. In the case of education, like timely interventions in school, in the case of uh, you know, older adults, you know, medication or something like that to treat the symptoms. Now, the imaging methods that I used are not novel. I didn't develop them. 
but they are still not in routine clinical practice yet. So the significance of my dissertation is to highlight that these methods need to be investigated further. Need, we need to have more established rigorous guidelines. And the way any diagnostic or treatment method makes it into clinic is through FDA approval. And for that to be needed, it needs to be beneficial on an individual level. The results that I showed were on a group level, except for the outlining of lesions. But on an individual level, for them, to, for there to be personalized medicine, we need a lot more data and a lot more analyses to form these um, standards, like diagnostic standards for healthy population to which we can compare the patient population. So in the case of, I'm currently working with Alzheimer's disease and aging. So in the case of that, there are massive international data sets looking at similar imaging patterns. So we can have a, a, a population comparison with a standard healthy population for each of the individual patients. So coming back to the question, the point of my thesis is to highlight that this is important. It tells us different things about the brain. It tells us that in the case of extensive damage, there still may not be a functional association. In the case of not observable damage, there is still a functional association. So it's it's more of a plea to include uh, these non-standard imaging sequences or imaging modalities into more mainstream clinic, if that makes sense. I wonder if there's a relationship between the work that Sebastian is doing and your work. The, the biggest con common overlap is the neural network. I also use uh, something called a convolutional neural network where um, we provide the inputs to the images to the neural network and the output was those beautiful bright colored outlines that you saw. Mm. It went through the processes and the machine learning learned how to detect them and we fine tune the parameters to get there. Amazing. Can I ask you a question about yes. that particular part? Um, yes, please. I'm of course, very curious about that. Um, so I actually have three questions. <laughs> um, the first one is how large were the, um, the sample sizes that you used for the training? Second is who had to do the data labeling? Because I'd <laughs> imagine that that's kind of, can be tedious, right? And, and the it's, third one, it's, it has to be particular, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, right, and you need a lot of expertise in it, right, to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the third one is, um, is the plan or do you imagine that this tool that you created will help um, practitioners like neuro neurologists or radiologists, I'm not an expert, um, identify these, these lesions in the future? Okay, if I lose track of the questions, I may ask yeah. you again. So for Sorry. the first question, the sample size, um, I looked at a very specific type of lesions in gray matter, which are not commonly observed, first of all, because they are very sensitive, very small, you need different sequence, different imaging modalities for that. Um, so I had about, I wanna say over 2000 lesions in total of which maybe um, 300 or something were gray matter lesions. And my goal was to segment the big lesions in the white matter as well as the little lesions in the gray matter. Um, in terms of sample size itself, it was the number of patient data we had is uh, good, not yet good for publications. Um, so I had to use methods like cross-validation, data augmentation, and to uh, reproduce or like produce different kinds of images just with computational tools and get there. Okay, and the second question, we had a team of radiologists, radiology residents working on this project. Almost all work that we do in the biomedical field will have to have the ground truth, which is the ult ultimate ground truth are the doctors. So we had Dr. Lev Bangiev from Stony Brook Medicine. He was the main radiologist in this project. Uh, we had Dr. Patricia Coyle over at Neurology who, who worked with us on the MS uh, participant list and helps us understanding um, the results that we find. So that answers your second question. We had a team working on it and verified by neuroradiologists with at least 15 years of experience or something like that. And the third question, oh, the tool that I developed, what's the impact? Um, as I said in the previous answer, these tools for them to become mainstream clinical use, they need to go through FDA approvals that needs you know, reproducibility studies, robustness studies. Um, I don't know if I personally 
can make it into a tool like that. But there are large um, ventures in um, companies which are doing these, which are mass producing these as a pipeline for use in the clinic along with the MRI scanners. But most of them focus on white matter. So perhaps papers like mine and the four or five others that are out there would push them to also look into these type of sequences and these type of uh, methods. Thank you. I think there's another question from an yeah, that. Yes, okay. So mm -hmm. psychomotor and cognitive testing with drug treatments. Okay, so we did have cognitive tests and we had, we also had motor disabilities tests, but we did not have drug treatments as part of the study. And that's because the MS is treated with, uh, it could be treated with like corticosteroids for symptom management. Um, there could be clinical trials as well, but they need to be highly controlled for us to know whether what we're studying is a result of what's in the brain or is a result of the action of the drug. For example, if inflammation is reduced, the measures of, inflammation is increased or reduced. Uh, the measures may not be um, accurately pointing towards structural integrity. So it needs to be highly controlled. So for this study and many others, we looked at patients who did not have recent manifestation of symptoms and were not on any new medication within a stable period of time, a certain period of time. Thank you, Annette. I will keep working on this problem, yes. I should probably read this out for people who are not able to see this chat. Um, so a follow-up comment was that this, work has implications for use in testing future therapies and to please keep working on this problem. Um, this is wonderful. It sounds like this uh, colloquium is becoming generative for a lot of different people in a lot of different directions. So this is wonderful. This is what it's about. Thank you. Any more questions now for Sinduja? No? Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, our last uh, awardee today is uh, Jonathan Rowski. Jonathan uh, is a PhD candidate in the Linguistics Department and the Institute for Advanced Computational Science. His work is called Structure and Learning in Natural Language. His work concerns the mathematics of language and learning. His dissertation studies the behavior of grammatical inference algorithms, uncovering precise computational conditions on successful language acquisition from limited data. Jonathan. Yes, thank you everyone. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, great. Okay, let me share my screen here then. Okay. Let's do a presenter view. Okay, super. Everybody can see this quite well? Great. Okay. So yes, thank you to everybody um, for organizing this and for attending and for asking such good questions. I'm pretty happy that I get to go last because it seems like the topic of language has come up <laughs> pretty significantly over the course of this colloquium. Megan's dissertation showed us how beautiful language can be when it's used um, by a community to convey ideas. And we also sh uh, show that people use ideas from language and learning to talk about their own work, right? So two of the dissertations that we saw previously um, use uh, a particular definition of learning in order to discover something about the natural world. And so my dissertation combines these two ideas to show that language on the one hand is um, beautiful, not only because it exists and can be used by a community, but because it's learned. One of the most interesting facts about language um, is that everybody learns one. You learn one, I learn one, everybody in the Zoom calls learned one, and we're able to use them flexibly without consulting one another. Okay, and this is quite surprising. It's actually quite a miracle that we learn language at all. Let me give you an example. Um, from a fact about, about language, right? And this fact, you might have heard of it before because it's not actually a language specific property, but it's a, a mathematical property. It's called Zipf's Law. And Zipf's Law tells us that um, the way that language is used is not uniform. 
So if I take a particular collection of words, say from, I think this one is from the what's called the Brown Corpus, which is a bunch of um, text data that's used um, for the world's languages. And if, if I take those words and I order them, you know, from left to right here, according to their, you know, the most frequent word is on the left and the least frequent word is on the right. We notice that there is a sort of very skewed distribution of this word data, okay? In particular, if you look at the most frequent word, the, it is twice as frequent as the second most frequent word, right? Of, right? So of is one half, uh, shows up one half the time as the does, right? And shows up about one third of the time that the does. Um, the fourth word will show up about one fourth as frequently and so on and so on until the nth word shows up about one over n as many times as the uh, most frequent word, right? So this is what's called a power law distribution. And it falls under the general term of something called a Zipf's law is that most language data is rare, okay? If you look at the bulk of data down here, most words, most phrases, most sentences, most anything that a child or a, some, any learning system you can think of appears only once, okay? So this is pretty bad for learning, right? Because it means that more data is not going to help. It means in particular that the neural network methods that Sebastian um, and Sanduja's dissertation looked on, which are extraordinarily data hungry, are very have a very difficult time dealing with anything language related, okay? But yet children persevere, they learn language, okay? And in fact, they don't just learn particular languages, they learn grammars, okay? So what's a grammar? Well, the grammar constrains possible linguistic structures. So here's, a, here's a, some constraints that exist um, in the world's languages, right? One possible constraint that a learner might learn is that all vowels in a word must obey some shared property, right? So for example, words in Turkish like arkadash or Hungarian rumamat, where the vowels aren't the same, but they, they are all produced in the back of the mouth, so they share that backness property. Another constraint might be that words might alternate consonants and vowels. So some of you might know this Hawaiian word, humu, humu, nuku, nuku, apua, right? Another um, constraint might be that words must contain at least one stressed syllable. This is true of all languages. Um, another constraint might be that sentences require even numbers of noun phrases. This is true of no languages, okay? But we can still imagine such a constraint being there, right? So there are distinctions between grammars that can exist, grammars that do exist, and grammars that don't exist, okay? So how do learners learn these from this very, very, very small, very sparse data? Um, well, there's a really big paradox here, which is called the paradox of induction, which is that for any piece of data that you can get, right, there are uncountably infinite many hypotheses or grammars that you could posit for this data, okay? So if you wanna think about this in another terms, um, imagine trying to draw a curve through points in a line, right? There's infinitely many possible curves that you could draw for any particular set of points in a graph, right? Um, so how does one do it? Well, most of the programs that you use to do it have what are called inductive biases, right? These are a priori um, structures. In the case of language, they're linguistic structures like trees, strings, and graphs. And then search strategies for figuring out which of the hypotheses to pick, right? So the basic idea is you have a set of hypotheses from some unordered space. You can think of it as like a bag of hypotheses and you pick one out one at a time and you use some statistical heuristics to compare them and to decide is this one better than the last one? Should I, am I close enough to my data that I wanna keep it? So the main point of the dissertation is that these statistical heuristics are unnecessary, okay? So there's, uh, there's several contributions that I make. The first is to give a unified notion of linguistic structure. Um, I borrow this idea from a mathematical field called finite model theory. And the basic idea is that linguistic structures are compositional, that a well-formed structure, set structures that satisfy constraints depend on their parts, which I call factors, and the, but it's a very technical term. And then the idea is a grammar is just a collection of these well-formed parts, okay? And the second contribution is to say that this notion of linguistic structure, because it's unified, Get, has consequences for the hypothesis space. In particular, it orders hypotheses into a structure called a partial order, which you can see on the sort of right-hand side here. A partial order is just a way of organizing um, a particular uh, view of sets, okay? So in the particular, the, the um, structure that these structures give to the hypothesis space is to gen uh, order constraints from general to specific, Okay, so there are less general constraints than there are specific constraints. This is also quite intuitive, right? There are more ways to say something specifically than there are ways to say it generally. Okay, 
So these two notions of structure enable successful learning, okay? Um, why? Well, because um, it allows you to give a very particular way to explore the hypothesis space. And this is the third contribution of my dissertation, which is a learning algorithm that operates without statistical heuristics. The idea is that a learner who's presented with data, which you can see here in sort of green, is just a set of points in this space, right? That's equivalent to memorizing the data. So a learner starts out way down at the bottom here and entertains hypotheses from general to specific and starts traversing this space up and up and up. And if the learner finds a general hypothesis that works, it's allowed to ignore or filter out the more specific variants of it, right? So if a learner says, I don't want to have, um, I want to have all vowels in a word agree, it doesn't matter that I want all O's to agree or all A's to agree or all E's to agree, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is pretty great. And in the dissertation, I show that it works. It's provably correct and it will converge on a grammar given the data. But there's one problem, which is that there's overlap, which I've shown in this picture here. That is multiple hypotheses can have overlap with the amount of structures that they allow or disallow, okay? So what I also do is um, shift the paradigm in a way to what's called abductive inference, which is a way to select the best hypotheses to rule out overlap, okay? And then some further contributions to the dissertation are I run some simulations on linguistic data. In particular, um, two, two uh, case studies are with English consonant clusters. And I also look at Ketchwood uh, long distance dependencies across words. And what we find is very encouraging that the learned grammars rival um, some inductive inference algorithms, which are very widely used and popular in linguistics. And finally, uh, while the learning algorithms work over discrete structures, I provide a way to translate them to distributed representations which involves uh, taking finite model theory, turning it into multilinear algebra, which says that the notion of linguistic structure uh, is translated into what are called tensors, which are generalizations of matrices that take points in the space and turn them into other points in the space. Okay, the reason we wanna do this is we want to connect these sort of restrictions in the symbolic world to the connections um, or the restrictions in the neural world, which nobody really knows about, but which hopefully this idea of structure gives us some handle on. So the main takeaways from this are that structure matters. Structure matters both in the way that representations are defined, the way hypothesis spaces are defined, and structure allows us to overcome data sparsity, right? And so the main contribution of my dissertation is to make a mathematical separation between the structures learners entertain and the way that they entertain them and collect them. So yes, they're very brief, but you know, of course there's a whole dissertation to read if you're curious about it. <laughs> yes, so thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I have a lot of thoughts going on, and I, I, I'm not sure I entirely followed the um, the course of it. But that's my limitations, not yours. And um, but I, I have a quick question, actually, which is: Do you, in these language models, are you accounting for spoken language? as opposed to written or material forms of language? Or is that something you're not particularly concerned with? That's an excellent question. So the nature of the way that I've defined it is such that it can work for any representation of language that you'd like, right? So there is, and, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a way that the user, whoever's going to use this, whether that's the linguistic analyst who's trying to describe their own data, the developmental psychologist who's trying to understand the mental structures learners are entertaining, or some language engineer who's trying to use these things for speech tech, for example, they all have to represent language data somehow. That's either as text, it's either as spoken corpora, it says graphs, it says something, right? So uh, the way that, this, that the representations are defined is agnostic. So the, the guarantees here hold for any definition of linguistic structure that you want, right? So it gives the user choice, but it also commits the user to consequences of those choices, okay? Um, which is exactly what children do every single day of the week. They make choices and then the consequences for language are apparent, right? So they make errors depending on the structures that they use. They infer certain hypotheses over others. Um, but, you know, we wanted it to be as general as possible exactly to avoid the problem that I think you're thinking of, which is, well, what if it works for this and what if it doesn't work for something else, right? Um, so the answer is we're agnostic to it, which I think is a benefit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Can I ask what is a little bit of a follow-up on that? And Jonathan, you already 
sort of started to address this, but you know, the, the immediate thing I went to is thinking about how children learn language for the very first time. And I was just wondering, does your model give us any additional insight perhaps into how they're, how they're learning and how they're, how they're forming these structures and learning about them? I was just, I was thinking about, you know, in one of your last charts that, you know, there's, there's only a small baseline of, of, of observations and then the rest is unobserved and they're having to make it up as they go along. And I would imagine for the younger the child, of course, the fewer potential observations they've had. Um, are, there, are there additional things that you can learn from your model? Yeah, well, with respect to the way that children are learning language, it's, it's important to remember that just like with Shuja's work, there's a certain amount of abstraction that goes on with any sort of mathematical study. And that's done for a reason, all right? It's to sort of narrow you in on a very particular set of things that you can be certain on. Okay, so there's all sorts of stuff going on with kids, right? All, all sorts of things. But what we do know about, about the way that children are learning language is that um, it's commonly conceived of as that children are little statistics engines, that they're receiving language data and they're operate using statistical learning strategies to operate over them, right? So these children use frequencies to do certain things. Children will select hypotheses based on frequencies. Children will create rules and exceptions to those rules over using frequencies, for example, right? So a common one is like, you know, children will over apply suffixes, right? So like I aided the, I, I aided dinner last night instead of just ate, right? Or I, I, I ran to the store, right? You know, so they'll over apply rules that they've done. Now, on the other hand, it seems that these statistical strategies are somewhat ad hoc. Right? And they're a consequence of the way that analysts have been thinking about um, the problem of language acquisition. And so what I'm, so the sort of overarching method is that in many cases in language, the, um, <laughs> yes, yes, the statistics engine can be the new nickname. <laughs> yes, um, you're not alone. You're not the first person to posit that nickname. But yes, the, the, but that's a problem because, you know, children aren't, you know, it, it's, we're, we think of them as statistics engines because that's the way that we think about learning. Right, you need to approximate something. You're trying to get arbitrarily close to something. You need some heuristic to choose between things. But the point of my dissertation is to show that structure, if minds are structured in a certain way, and the way that learners entertain structures and data is constrained, then the statistics goes away, right? Then the way that the learner can arbitrarily select can be augmented with statistics if you'd like, but it's not necessary, right? And so, you know, they're, they're, and that's why we did all these comparisons to the inductive statistics-based learning models was to say that, you know, do we get things that rival theirs? If so, and ours doesn't necessarily use these statistical strategies, well, then what's the point of it, right? Um, and so that's one contribution, right? Is to show that the structure plays just as much of an importance uh, as statistics. And this is true outside of language too, but it is very strikingly apparent in the way that we think of how children uh, work within the world, right? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. But of course, there's more to be done. Tons more to be done. It's just one result among many. <laughs> there's a question from Annette in, the, in oh, yeah. the So interesting work. Does this also mean that this can lead to a language bias and then trying to learn a new language? Yeah, so yes. So if you think about that space that I showed about earlier, which is this sort of partially ordered structure, each sort of point and collection of points within that space, you can think of as a language, right? And so you're traversing through it in order to pick out the one that you're eventually going to settle on, right? And it's important to realize that I mean language in the sense of, you know, a set of patterns here, not just as in English, quote unquote, or Japanese, quote unquote. It's just the set of rules and constraints that you use in order to, um, you know, construct these linguistic structures. And um, so, yes, there is a bias. You will be traversing through some of them. And this is exactly what we see in empirical studies of language acquisition, that children will make what are seen as errors in their languages, you know, the language of their community, say English, but which are perfectly well formed in another community. So a child will exhibit German-like behavior for a bit before switching over to, you know, Hawaiian-like behavior for a bit before eventually converging on the language of their community. And that's, you know, that's quite beautiful because it shows exactly what we're showing here, right? That the children are sort of moving their way through this predefined structure in order to settle on what was, what's eventually going to be there, their, you know, learned one, you yeah. um, But yeah, so language bias in the sense is really a learning bias. Um, it's a bias in the way that you entertain and select between competing hypotheses of the very limited and very unhelpful data that children are given. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to ask, 
Jonathan, if you would be able to share with me the zip um, graph. Uh, and I was very curious about the, t the long rare tail at the, the, long tail, far, yeah. at the far right, uh, what that consists of. Um, most stuff, poet, most things poet. you can think of are in the long tail. Yeah, right, right. Uh, the poet in me is, is interested in, the, in that part of the graph. <laughs> but the real, the real interesting part about that graph is that it means that the central limit theorem just goes away. Yeah. Most machine learning algorithms operate on the assumption that this, this, the central limit theorem, which says that your data is normally distributed, you can just keep getting more stuff and you'll approximate the normal distribution. That doesn't happen because yeah. you have this t huge long tail which means the more data you get, most of it is in the you know top part of it, right? Most things that you see are very few forms and most forms are gonna show up once, if at all. So big data methods, sorry. <laughs> it, also, well, it also reminded me of the n-grams from Google. Uh, and it made me think that maybe there's also some interesting historical sort of permutations to some of these theories that might be of interest maybe to you, but definitely to me. But You're exactly right with these n-grams. So for those who aren't familiar, an n-gram is a chunk of language structure that is n segments long, right? Or just chunk of size n, right? That could be three words, three segments, three whatevers, right? And if you think back to that partially ordered structure, that's exactly how things are ordered. You have, you know, uh, if, you, if you don't like having the word the, you also won't like having the word the cat, right? So if I have a constraint that says, I don't like having you know, nouns before verbs, it doesn't matter which noun and verb I put in there, right? you can just be any of them, right? So the one grams are more general than the two grams, the two grams are more general than the three grams, et cetera. Right? And so yes, that, you're exactly right with that connection. As for historical things, I have no clue. <laughs> okay, well, again, uh... Jonathan, you're absolutely right in that you prefaced your talk by saying that there was a link between all of these that, that in some uh, overarching way we might think about the language that binds um, all, the, all the inquiry that we saw today. And, um, and it's really gratifying to, to do that kind of thinking um, and sharing. Um, and, and that's what colloquia are all about. Um, this kind of uh, deep expression uh, across ranges of knowledge and technique and method. And I'm, I'm just really excited and thrilled by all the work we saw today. Uh, if you are out there, clap your hands, show your appreciation um, for these outstanding students, scholars, young, young um, change agents. Um, so appreciate it very much. Um, I want to end by making sure everyone comes to tomorrow's virtual grad award ceremony. Um, promises to be quite quite nice. Um, and um, the provost will also be joining us. So I think it'll be a, a, a really wonderful event. And it'll really be an attempt uh, to honor the entire graduate community um, uh, which, you know, has been sort of fragmented by separate um, commencement ceremonies this week. And I want to really encourage us to, to join together as a graduate community tomorrow for that virtual um, celebration. I think, what time is it, um, Jana, exactly? Same time, 11 a.m. 11 a.m. 11 o'clock. Yep. Terrific. All right, everybody mark it into your calendars. Thank you again for coming. Uh, and thank you, Gianna and Katie and the staff at the Graduate School for helping put this on, Rohit for, for streaming it. Uh, amazing job as always. Thank you.